Welcome everyone. And um, let's now talk a little bit about data visualization. Actually, this a little bit is going to take the hour uh, of your life. So I will do my best that this is an hour well spent. Let me just quickly introduce myself. So my name is Vitaly Rudnitsky and uh, I'm primarily known as Sismundovic on most of the on most of the social media. I am an SAP employee and uh, I do work in the team that is called developer relations. I am one of developer advocates there and I'm happy that we have some more uh, developer advocates uh, here on SAP online track uh, today as well. Uh, why do I feel that I have some credibility to talk about data visualization is basically before joining this team and before joining SAP, I spent 12 years as BI technology consultant and uh, I was working primarily on BW. I got involved with SAP community at that time and uh, I was uh, one of the topic leaders for something that was called BI Accelerator at that time. And this uh, community involvement and my hopefully technical expertise helped me to become one of SAP mentors. So I was uh, really proud wearing SAP mentor shirt for four years. And uh, I am self-proclaimed uh, king of data geeks. So please forgive me. Uh, this, uh, now I'm based in Poland in the beautiful city of Wrocław, where since five years I am organizing as well local meetups. Uh, including SAP Insight Tracks. Usually by this time, actually in May, we would have SAP Insight Track uh, already happened uh, here in the city, but uh, because of the current situation, we had to move it to uh, fall. And we still hope that with the situation improving, as we see, we will be able to uh, have this as well as an on-site event. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, kudos to everyone who is organizing this very first SAP online track as well. And you can find me on SAP community when you go and look for peoplesap.com, Vitaly Rudnitsky. Just a little bit of ad break, as I mentioned, SAP inside track of Roslov, hopefully coming to the city in September. Now, let us dig into the topic. So let's start with a little bit of the theory. Why visualization? So as an example, right? Uh, we know that one picture sometimes was thousand words. So let's look maybe not on thousand words, but at least at a couple of words. So we are talking about something that is a simple shape in Euclidean geometry, which is the set of all points in a plane that are at a given distance from a given point. Did anyone get what I'm talking about? I showed the picture and uh, we know what I'm talking about. Basically, I was talking about a circle, right? So first of all, visualization helps us to understand. So far, I was talking about understanding text, but let us look at numbers, right? So this is quite famous um, example of four data sets representing different numbers. And what can we understand from these numbers? Pretty much nothing except that in this set number four, we see that there is an kind of like outlier, right? But everything else look exactly the same. Now in the past, we would usually, and in, in the past, I mean like 70 years ago, we would just simply run some statistic analysis on these data sets and guess what? Statistical properties of these four data sets, they are all pretty much the same, right? It is really only once we visualize this data, then we can see what really is happening in these four data sets, including visual pot of this outlier that I mentioned in this data set number four. Uh, some people uh, in big companies uh, kind of like took this challenge seriously. So uh, there is this really fun example uh, done by a research team at Autodesk, where you can see, again, visualization of different data sets which have exactly the same statistical uh, characteristics, but represent completely different pictures. 
Next thing when it comes to, uh, to visualization is that basically you might have seen this statistics that if uh, I would be just talking to you today, the probability that you are remembering or the amount of information that would you, you would remember after three days is about 10%. Because I'm using visualization, the probability that you remember stuff is uh, up to 65%. Another thing is putting picture, uh, putting something into perspective, right? So looking at this beautiful picture of, sorry, uh, yes, uh, beautiful photo of uh, our uh, blue planet, we can think, so what's wrong with, you know, this whole water crisis because our planet indeed looks blue. But now... Uh, sorry, Vitaly, I... uh, we got noticed that the uh, visual is not coming through. Maybe you can just uh, start sharing um, the PowerPoint or close the presentation and start it again up. Okay, I... Just close okay. your PowerPoint presentation, uh, like the presentation mode and, and start sharing again. Because I saw on YouTube channel that it is refreshing, so. Okay, perfect. Sorry now we see that. a beautiful picture, right? So at least uh, it comes up here again. Yes. Thank you. And sorry, I forgot to close Outlook. Okay, so uh, yeah, now this picture is unfortunately not as beautiful because now uh, we have a different visualization of the same data and we see the amount of water that we have on the whole planet. Even worse, if we uh, now visualize what is, what is the drinkable water, then these are only these two small drops. Uh, and this is the whole drinkable water that we have on the planet for all of uh, people here. Uh, the other example of visualization that I found really impactful recently is the amount of uh, plastic bottles that are being produced every hour, right? So every hour it would just cover the monument of Chris the Redeemer uh, in Brazil. And during the whole day, it would cover the whole Eiffel Tower. So this is why visualization is important. Now let's talk about some basics of data visualizations. So primary thing, when it comes to data visualization is obviously the fact that our eye can see. And uh, it is uh, said that the human eye can see between seven to 10 million colors. And I'm curious how many can you, or can I? Uh, this is a picture of 1 million pixels that I found uh, on Wikipedia. Uh, obviously by the moment you receive this picture, it will be uh, screwed already by the fact that it is translated and that it is uh, uh, it is you know compressed by video and so on. But basically, you can go to the link that is included here on the slide and try to differentiate all this one million uh, slides there. Uh, sorry, one million pixels as well. But how many can we name? And uh, I know that this might be somewhat stereotypical, but uh, guilty as charged, I can say that when we were choosing with my wife color for uh, our bedroom, this was exactly the situation. The number of colors she could name and the number of colors uh, I could say, uh, or I could differentiate. Vitaly, we are still experiencing some lag, unfortunately. Um, may I suggest to turn off the video in order to get more bandwidth for the streaming? Sure, sure. Sorry about that. Thank you. So, 
I hope I, I hope it will work better now. So when we talk about colors, this color send particular messages as well. A really interesting story that we can leave for the other times. For example, why we are using uh, red, yellow, green when we are talking about. Uh, uh, for example, traffic lights, and then these are three colors that are quite often being used on um, uh, different charts as well. But the if, if I would focus only on one color that I would like to uh, present to you today is the color that is called 448C in uh, Panton palette. And what is so special about this one? So this is the this is this color. And this is a color that is called the ugliest color on earth. It was um, uh, run uh, by, it, it, there was uh, some research run by Australian government uh, who wanted to run anti-smoking campaign in the country. And uh, this is a color that was chosen as, as I mentioned, the ugliest color on earth. And therefore it was um, uh, mandatory supposedly and people who are based in Australia can uh, prove me wrong, uh, it, it was mandatory to use it on uh, cigarette boxes uh, because, once again, this is the color that should, dis that should cause this disgusting uh, feeling once you're looking at this. But uh, because it was quite a famous color in 2016, so obviously others, like fashion uh, designers, used this fame and uh, tried to include this into their uh, fashion collections as well. So when we are talking about colors, it is really important to understand as well the so-called color wheel. And this color wheel tells us what colors we should uh, put in palette in our visualization if we want this color to be the most distinguished from uh, each other. Uh, luckily, you don't need to do this uh, anyhow uh, manually. You can just I go, for example, to this great website that Adobe made available, and then uh, this computer, uh, your computer can help you to build these palettes that you can later on import into your visualization tools and use it there. So here is an example, for example, for us at SAP when it comes to brand elements, right? So we have the description of, for example, so-called secondary color palette that we should be using in our presentations as well. But if you look at my slides, they are still primarily uh, following this primary uh, colors that SAP defined, meaning white, black, shade, shades of gray, and gold. So we talked about colors. Now let's talk about shapes. So uh, this is an example of uh, another research that has been done, which says what has been most accurate when it comes to representing, uh, you know, uh, data uh, when you are visualizing this, right? The, there is the whole set of different uh, charts that are available for you. And this is one of the really nice uh, uh, work that has been done uh, almost 15 years ago that is called Chart Picker, where depending on what you want to convey using this chart, you should just pick if this is relationship that you want to represent a distribution. And then depending on how many data points you have, you would just go and pick the proper chart to convey the proper message. But one thing that you can see uh, these charts represent, and again, it was from 15 years ago, is that these are the charts that help you to precise represent the true data value. Why do I mention this? Because what happens right now is, especially with the race of machine learning and you know predicting predictions. Obviously, these predictions are not hundred percent sure, neither uh, never. Therefore, now we need to uh, have as well special charts uh, which represent uncertainty in data. Right. So, uh, error bars is something that has been known for a while. But uh, for example, this so-called ice chart is something that uh, is becoming quite popular right now. Uh, confidence strips, confidence bands, and so on. So if you want to dig a little bit more into you know, this data visualization theory, then I would certainly recommend you just to go and download uh, this uh, data visualization handbook that uh, our SAP Analytics Cloud colleagues prepared. And uh, hopefully, you will find this helpful as well. 
But I called this uh, talk Data Visualization Then and Now because I wanted to dig a little bit into the history of data visualization. And uh, that's why on this previous talk that uh, Tommy Pavlos had, uh, I mentioned that I will be talking about Excel, but very briefly. For me personally, the history of data visualization started uh, about 1992 when for the very first time I saw Excel 3.0. And this was something that blew my mind at that time. But uh, surprisingly, the whole history of data visualization started a long time before. So what is the first known chart? When did it come? Supposedly, this is the one. So this is the time series chart that is coming from uh, some book that is dated around 10th, 11th century. And this is where one of monks was uh, just measuring uh, the movement of planets and, um, and, and, and the moon and representing how they're changing over the horizon over the time. Uh, unfortunately, for another almost nine centuries, this knowledge was kind of like lost. Uh, even though some other people would argue that the very first uh, data visualization is nothing else but just a music notation, right? Because music notation is nothing else but you have just time series. And then on this uh, time series chart, you can see a frequency of particular sounds as you are moving through this time. Uh, this is another... Uh, early uh, data visualization, something that we would call a column chart this day, even though some others are arguing that this is just some music instrument. Uh, but still, we want to believe that this is the very first uh, column chart coming from 40th century. Another impressive work is from the end of the 17th century. Uh, there is a book of um, about 800 pages where the guy in Netherlands described how he mixed uh, all these different colors using different ingredients. And please note that this is something that happened 270 years before uh, the so-called Pantone uh, color system was uh, became popular. I, I didn't want to say it was invented. Uh, so uh, the bar chart from uh, the 18th century uh, even though I would call this is a little bit more interesting, this is something that we were called uh, stacked area chart uh, from, from the same uh, 18th century, uh, something that we would probably call tree map, representing the sizes of capitals uh, of uh, different countries uh, by the end of 18th century. Uh, this is interesting chart because for the very first time we can see the use of the pie charts, which in this case represent the size of the countries combined with the bar charts which represent uh, the number of uh, people living in this particular country as the number of uh, taxes collected. So please note that in Poland it should be a beautiful time at the beginning of 19th century because taxes were pretty much zero. Uh, this probably is the very first geospatial chart, even though it is not as famous as this next one. Uh, the, the, the one that is uh, many believe is the very first uh, geospatial chart that helped to, uh, to, to, to find the root cause for the cholera outbreak in central London in 1840, uh, sorry, in 1854. Uh, this uh, was attributed to the um, uh, water well that was uh, in that district and this uh, water well is still available there in case you are visiting London and you want to see it. Uh, the other very interesting diagram uh, is so-called Rose diagram and what makes it especially interesting is that it was created by uh, Florence Nightingale who was a nurse. So nurse was her, let's say, profession but statistician was her hobby. Uh, it is extremely important to mention uh, Nightingale because basically just a few weeks ago, it was the uh, 200th anniversary of her birthday and uh, her, her, her involvement, not just in uh, making medicine better, but as well statistic uh, more ubiquitous uh, is something that is extremely important to recognize. 
Uh, this is another interesting example uh, because for the very first time as well, we see three-dimensional graphics. And let me mention that it is not something that computer generates, but this is something that the guy who is using only ink and ruler just was able to draw. Then uh, the period between 1975 and 1985 is something that is called the golden age of statistical graphics. This is where these four main books which made the contribution to this uh, area uh, were written. Actually, I have uh, one of them on my uh, bookshelf as well. But still, in these cases, they are still primarily discussing how to draw it manually, right? It is 1990s when the explosion of computer aid visualizations is uh, coming. Uh, for example, uh, the film uh, uh, film finder, right? So something that was extremely innovative in 1994 when it was created. This is uh, the visual aid based on statistics, based on your preferences, based on the attributes to find the movie that uh, you might enjoy. Okay, now that uh, we went through this history of visualization, let me dig into the modern times. And let me just use two, I would call, extreme examples uh, of uh, data visualization. So first one is something that we would call a static uh, managerial reporting. And for that, there is a standard that is called international business communication uh, that has been uh, created by one of the former uh, McKinsey consultants. And then he made this uh, Creative Commons project in uh, 2013. And since then, it is supported by IBCS Association, uh, where SAP is participating too. Basically, uh, this, uh, this is a set of best standards, which are uh, which are describing what the proper data visualization for management reporting should be, right? It is based uh, on particular rules that are uh, grouped into seven areas. And let us just have an example. So uh, I'm sharing right now on my right side, uh, on the right side of the screen, uh, the example of uh, two charts from our 2019 uh, year report from SAP. And let us quickly have a look at some of these rules that uh, are described by IBCS. So uh, one of them says, use the correct chart type. Right, And one of the main important golden rules there is that, for example, if we are talking about uh, representing time, we should use the column chart. But when we are talking about representing categories or types, we should be using bar chart. And this is something that you can see here on the right as well. Right, So when we are talking about the uh, SAP revenue year over year, then you can see that it is represented as a column chart. And if we are talking about revenue by the revenue type, then as the standard says, or the best practice says, uh, we are using uh, the uh, bar chart for that. The other rule is, again, we are talking about best practices for, let's say, management reporting, avoid decorative colors, right? So before that, I was talking about these palettes and so on. Here it says, use as few colors as possible, and ideally they should be just, uh, you know, 100 shades of gray. Let's put it this way. And you can see that we just stick here as well to our brand colors, and that uh, one more rule that is not mentioned here is that the data that represent the current reporting uh, time period should stand out. And that's why you can see as well that 2019, Indeed, we are using this, uh, our brand gold color, but everything else should be just a background for this data, right? And that's why, for example, this uh, uh, data from 2015, 2018 are just light gray. Again, they are just creating some background for this current year. Uh, another uh, rule says, uh, remove everything that is unnecessary. 
right? And uh, this is where you can see we are following this rule as well, right? So there are no grids here, and we put uh, data values right next to the columns which represent them. Uh, one more rule, uh, show overlay charts. If you can represent two charts in one, do not split them into separate charts. And you can see in this upper example as well, uh, when it comes to uh, change year over year, then this data and visualization is included into the revenue uh, bar chart, uh, sorry, column chart as well. So let me just... Uh, switch to the moment. I, I kind of like didn't spend too much time on this IDCS because you can, and I would really encourage you to explore this by yourself. And uh, right now there is IDCS version one on one available. And then in, uh, in, in there you can find, you know, these rules that uh, I was briefly mentioning the, the and uh, all these areas that I was talking about. Uh, what uh, you can find more is resources. And in these resources, you can find uh, for example, templates and suggestions and uh, some of the examples before and after uh, that the guys, for example, used for SAP annual report from 2013. Uh, but one thing that I wanted to make you aware uh, is because it is kind of like still relatively fresh, uh, is uh, there is a software that has been uh, certified to support this methodology and actually SAP Analytics Cloud is one of them. So it was not certified in December 2019. It was recertified, meaning that uh, it had the certification for two years already. But with the new uh, new version of the standard and the new versions of SAP Analytics Cloud, we at SAP decided that it is worth to recertify this, right? And you can find some examples. And then from there, you can jump as well to SAP Analytics Cloud. And you can create here... Uh, the 30 day trial account, which uh, if you are into data visualization, I would certainly suggest you to do. Uh, in my case, uh, I'm actually using the login of the VS Bay University here in Wroclaw, where I'm visiting lecturer uh, as well. And as I mentioned, it is not that uh, like SAP Analytics Cloud is IDCS visualization software. All I'm saying is that SAP Analytics Cloud does support IDCS when it makes sense. Uh, I'm not going to spend any more time here right now because uh, basically I put some resources in my slide that you can find here. Uh, there are really nice uh, tutorials that you can find um, with examples how SAP Analytics Cloud support this uh, IDCS top 10 um, rules. And then uh, recently, Ingo Hilgefort uh, from SAP put as well really nice uh, video recordings. These video recordings only take 40 minutes. Uh, so uh, when you get time, you can just uh, go and watch them. So I will leave this uh, to everyone interested as the home exercise. So as I mentioned, this was an example of management reporting. Now let us move to the complete opposite uh, which is uh, something that is called exploratory data analysis. So what exploratory data analysis is? So in traditional data analytics, we usually start with the model or the schema that is known, right? So let's say we need to build this management reporting for our financial data, right? And this financial data is something that is already defined in ERP, right? So we know the model. Now, all that we need is that we just need to collect this data, right? So, for example, we are moving this uh, data from ERP system, from financial module uh, into BW, into HANA, or directly into SAP Analytics Cloud. And then we start data analytics, right? And in most of these cases, this data analytics is something that is pretty much predefined, right? Because we know what management, what business users want to report, right? So we do this data analysis and then we present this uh, in uh, in the form of data storytelling. What the difference uh, comparing to exploratory data analysis is, is that uh, with this rapid development of um, data area recently, uh, we quite often collect the data before we really understand them, right? So uh, an example can be, let's say we are running Qualtrics survey, 
right? And Qualtrics survey, we do not really sometimes know what answers with what uh, correlations can come there. Or let's say we are collecting some uh, IoT data, right? We do not always know upfront what kind of data uh, will be, uh, we know what kind of data will be collected there, but we do not always know exactly uh, what kind of measurements uh, will come from uh, from there, right? Uh, the other thing is, let's say, user click stream. Again, it is huge amount of data and we do not always know upfront the way uh, users will be clicking through our data prop uh, web properties, right? So that's why I'm saying that uh, in traditional uh, data analysis, uh, comparing to exploratory data analysis, we have this model up front. Here we start with the data collection, and usually this data is collected just in the form of some files. And only once data is collected, we start analyzing this data. And only based on this uh, analysis of data, we start building the model. And here often uh, these models are not just, let's say, static models, but this is something that we would call, for example, predictive analytics models, right? So these are the models that are explaining the world that has been measured in a way that we do not always know about this world. And only once we explore this and we build this model, only then we are going to data storytelling. So uh, now let me move to this uh, second example, and I hope that it's going to uh, work. So uh, usually for this kind of exploratory data analysis, uh, there are so-called data notebooks being used, uh, um, Apache Zeppelin being one example, uh, JupyterLab being another example, and this is an example that I'm going to use. Uh, I uh, will use this Jupyter that I deployed to SAP Cloud Platform trial. And uh, if you are interested how I did this, uh, I can include the link later on because uh, in one of the uh, our live coding streamings that I've done with my teammate Maxi, I kind of like showed how I did this. And uh, we did this more for fun than uh, for the real business uh, use case. But basically, now I have this Jupyter running in my SAP Cloud Platform trial account, and I can uh, connect to this. The thing that I'm going to use here because of the uh, you know short time that we have uh, is uh, uh, something that is available in our SAP samples. And the thing that I'm going to use is that uh, we have this Python library called HANA ML, and I'm connecting uh, using this HANA ML from my Jupyter notebook to HANA. Uh, I did already all the preparation stuff so that we don't need to uh, load data once again and so on. Where I really wanted to focus on is on one of the examples coming from this uh, repository that is called exactly exploratory data uh, analysis. Uh, so what I've done before, sorry, I, I didn't uh, show this, is that I just did git clone uh, of this repository from the GitHub. And uh, there are quite many different examples from for different APIs, but the one that I'm using is, as I mentioned, this uh, Python API, which is called HANA ML, and I'm using this uh, great uh, example that has been prepared there to estimate CARP uh, prices. So what I've done here is that, uh, let me just recheck that uh, we import this HANA ML and then let me just connect to my HANA Express. And then in my HANA Express, I uh, have already the table that is called this uh, used car prices. And now I created something that is called HANA data frame. HANA data frame means that all data is still stored in HANA, but I am working with this data from my client and it is only what I need is that calculated by HANA in the backend and then returned to my uh, frontend. So we can see that there are like 269, almost 27,000 records in this data set. But once again, they are all stored in, 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 in HANA, right? So uh, here is an example. Uh, right now on this uh, HANA data frame, uh, I'm running statistics, uh, which is um, 
uh, describing you know all the columns that I have, uh, the unique values, the null values, mean, max, and so on and so forth. But uh, even though I already executed this uh, and uh, I just wanted to move through this quicker, I would like to show you the select statement that was generated by Hana behind the scene so that we can get this result, right? So once again, this is the select statement. If I would just copy and paste it right now into some Hana session, we would get exactly the same result as here. But as you can see with this data package, I was able to do this just with a single Python uh, function. Uh, I'm going to skip through, uh, you know, these steps which are representing data in the form of uh, uh, some tables because really what I wanted to focus on, as I mentioned, is on data visualization, right? So, for example, uh, here we have the calculation of uh, of uh, top five uh, categories in our uh, in in our data. But now, if I would like to represent this, then in Python, there is uh, the most popular library that is called matplotlib. And now, just using this library, I could uh, visualize this data. As you can see, now we are not talking about IBCS, right? And all everything that was described as bad practices there uh, is being used here, but it is not the part of the focus right now for us uh, here once we are talking about exploratory data analysis, right? So then there is some more um, uh, more exploration happening here. And uh, you can see that, for example, in one of the next steps in the example, we are calling the predictive algorithm library uh, partition, uh, partition algorithm that is once again is executed completely in HANA in the backend and then returning just result uh, to us. But again, it is not uh, what we wanted to focus on uh, because uh, the other thing uh, or the other visualization that I wanted to share with you should be already a little bit more fancy. And this fancy representation is coming from another uh, uh, Python library that is gaining uh, popularity right now, something that is called Seaborn, right? And you can see that here we have already uh, somewhat different and somewhat more uh, more detailed representation of this data, right? So even though we have a scatter plot uh, in the mid, in 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 the uh, in the middle, we have as well histogram distributions on uh, both x uh, a uh, sorry x x and x y. Uh, now, one of the other uh, things that I wanted to show is something that is relatively new in this HANA uh, ML package, and this is HANA ML uh, package 1.0.8, is now that we have some of the visualizations already built into this exploratory data analysis uh, uh, subgroup of, uh, of, of out-of-the-box uh, functions. And uh, here, as you can see, I'm importing exploratory data analysis visualizer from this HANA ML uh, package. And now this whole preparation for this visualization is something that had happened on the HANA side. And then it is only representation, which is the correlation between different parameters of this used cars that is being returned to us. So again, you know, I just wanted to rush through this example to show you this other extreme where we are not using any prepackaged BI software, where we are wearing the hat of this more of the data statistician uh, or data science uh, scientist, as it is popular to call right now. And we work with this data much more deeply, and we are digging into this data uh, in uh, the way that is not precant or not prepared, but with all the flexibility that uh, the power of code is giving to us. Right, and then I mentioned that at the very end, uh, there is uh, always something that is called data storytelling, but data storytelling is something that is going, let's say, outside of the scope of our today's presentation, because what I really wanted to focus is more on the visualization, no, not exactly how we put now all this uh, data and visualizations to create the story that we want to uh, to tell. 
and what can be better uh, you know cartoon to be used here than this one from uh, our SAP colleague Timo Elliott and this is something that he uh, he, he he draw already almost five years ago and this is where digital disruption that we are experiencing right now that is being driven uh, by the situation that uh, is impacting most of us uh, uh, with the coronavirus. Okay, uh, last thing that I really wanted to go through is as well uh, to make you aware uh, is that data can be presented to can be used to present the truth, but as well can be manipul used to manipulate the truth, right? So, and what can be a better example than the uh, Soviet newspaper that was called Pravda or The Truth? And this is an example uh, taken from this uh, newspaper where you can see that there is no relationship whatsoever between the data value and data visualization of this data as being represented. And this is something that is usually called the lie factor uh, of the uh, data visualizations. Here is another example uh, where, uh, where the author wanted just to show how government is uh, spending money and how skyrocketing these spends are, right? But you can see that the trick that is being used here is once you are manipulating the scale of uh, Y and X, right? It is enough just to represent this chart slightly different, and then the meaning of this data visualization is becoming somewhat different. Yes, you know, spendings are growing, but they are not skyrocketing as the author wanted to show just using this previous uh, chart. Uh, this is another example uh, that was prepared by National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., uh, complaining that the spending uh, on uh, science uh, in the United States, uh, in the United Science, uh, States, is dropping. But the trick that we are using here is that once again you see that it is 1976. But the data that uh, or the time granularity that they used here on the X was decades, ten years, right? So basically, they are comparing five or in this case even four years spendings uh, or uh, four years. Uh, a budget that they are giving to 10 years uh, 10 years before, right? So again, if this would change to full 10 years, then you could see that actually here spending skyrocketed as well. Uh, this is one of the most famous visualization that would support a uh, wrong conclusion uh, when one of the uh, companies uh, investing on New York Stock uh, uh, Exchange said that they found the true way to find how uh, how to invest the money. So basically, they found and represented here on this chart that there is a strong correlation between solar radiation and the prices on both actually on New Stock Exchange and London Stock, right? And then you can find this really funny website uh, where you can find tons and tons of uh, the same uh, charts. For example, uh, the correlation between U.S. spending on science, space, and technology uh, correlated with suicides by hanging and suffocation. Have fun exploring this website. Uh, here is uh, another example, something that was published in one of the Polish newspaper in 1936, uh, where this article is saying uh, that one of the serious mathematicians did uh, predictions based on the history that uh, in 1859, uh, there was one weirdo for 500 normal people. And then in 1927, it was one weirdo in 150 people. And therefore, based on pure mathematical prediction in 1977, there will be one weirdo for every 100 normal people. And by 2001, sorry, by 2139, everyone on the planet Earth will be weirdo. Uh, here is another interesting uh, example. I'm not pulling this for, let's say, any polit political background, but, but how you can manipulate uh, you know, just using this uh, color representation, uh, 
in, uh, in, in trying to convince, uh, you know, your voters, right? So here, those who would vote for McCain are colored in red, uh, and those who would vote, or these counties in the US who would vote for Obama are colored in blue. And obviously this map look very reddish, even though uh, if we change this representation, because it is not the acres of land who are voting, but people, and we will now use the color representation just to represent as well the number of people living in a particular county, then you can see that this red color is not that dominating anymore. So uh, with this, now the spotlight is on you. And I hope that uh, if you were not into data visualization before that uh, I kind of like built some interest and you would like to uh, uh, invest a little bit more of your time uh, into going through some of this uh, content uh, and some of these links that I shared with you. Uh, and if you've been already into data visualization, then it obviously will always be great to hear your experience here as well. And with that, I would like to thank everyone uh, joining this uh, presentation live. Uh, I see that I did the mistake of putting you know, this uh, animation between slide transitions. I tried to always remember to remove this and to avoid doing this uh, uh, when streaming, uh, but um, I see that this impacted the video as it was streamed to uh, YouTube. Apologize for this. And with that, once again, thank you everyone for joining this session. Are there any questions? Thank you, Vitaly. And um, we have one question regarding the slides and uh, the examples that you showed, the Jupyter notebooks particularly. Um, will you share those afterwards as well? We do have a GitHub. <laughs> yes, so so basically, these slides uh, are available. I just forgot to put the link there. And uh, basically, if you just uh, look at, at the play that is called uh, Speaker Deck uh, and uh, Vitaly, uh, there is this data visualization uh, there. I will update these slides uh, kind of like with, with all the updates that I included as well for today. Uh, because the funny thing is that I've been using these slides since uh, 2012 when I presented them for the very first time at uh, SAP Inside Track in the Netherlands. Uh, so hopefully you will uh, you will get them. Right, and then you can also see the uh, the images that were a little bit um, blurred in the beginning. So I think that's uh, good for everybody. Now, at the end of the session, uh, if there are no further questions, uh, we still have a prize to win. And I would like to um, play the raffle with you. So let me just take over the screen. And I hope we got all the names here. So if you're a lucky winner, uh, I'd like to ask you to reach out to me. And now I'm just spinning the wheel. So the winner is Natalia Singer. Congratulations. And I would like to ask you to uh, follow the link that I'm uh, pasting in the chat right now. Um, Natalia Singer, please follow that link and enter your information. And then thank you, everybody, for participating. Have a nice day. Thank you, Tom, for supporting this.